Welcome everyone. We are so glad you are joining us. My name is Dr. Natasha Falahi, the sensitive doctor, and I am very excited to introduce our special guest today, Dr. Mario Martinez. Dr. Martinez is a clinical neuropsychologist who lectures worldwide on how cultural beliefs affect health and longevity. He is the founder of Biocognitive Science Institute, and he is the best-selling author of The Mind-Body Code, How to Change Beliefs That Limit Your Health, Longevity, and Success. Dr. Martinez, it is a great pleasure to have you joining us today. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to see you again. Yeah, um, we've done some work in the past before. Um, I've attended some of your workshops. We've done other interviews, and it's always such a, you know, fun, enlightening conversation. So I'm so excited to have you here today. But for people who aren't familiar with your work, I'd love for you to share a little bit about how you got into the work you're doing. Kind of what's that story that led you here? Well, I started uh, in my training as a neuropsychologist, a clinical neuropsychologist. And, and what neuropsychology does is that it looks at uh, any kind of brain injury or brain disease and how it affects your psychology or psychological or medical problems, how they affect your brain. But the training was mainly on what's happening when the brain has trauma or is disease. And I noticed that there was very little about when the brain is working well. And in medicine and, and other areas, uh, there's a tremendous concern with stress hormones, but very little with the causes of health, what I call the causes of health. So then I um, went into psychoneuroimmunology. My uh, mentor was the founder, George Solomon. And psychoneuroimmunology looks at uh, how thoughts and emotions affect the immune nervous and endocrine system, but it's still not looking at culture. So what I did is I brought culture in and I bring in cultural psychoneuroimmunology, which is how cultures affect your biological process in, through the nervous, immune and endocrine system. That's the idea. So what I'm working on is uh, in, in my books, as you know, I talk about the costs of health that they're inherited and that uh, longevity is culturally learned at any age. And this comes from the work I've done with centenarians, people who are over 100, who are healthy, and who have a way of living that's very independent. But I found, fortunately, that, it, that the contribution of genetics is only 20 to 25%. The rest is the cultural beliefs and, of course, the food and the environment, but mostly how they challenge the world and how they view the world. And, and we have some parameters now that can tell us how can you emulate uh, a centenarian so you can live a healthy, long life. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah, I, I love the field of psychoneuroimmunology as well and talk a lot about concepts in it. But, you know, this aspect that you brought in culture and how culture varies, you know, from culture to culture or in different places, that you can't kind of apply the same concepts or ideas to people around the world or in different subsets or cultures, because, um, you know, as we'll get into, we'll talk about different cultural ideas and beliefs can have different effects on people. Like some of them can be really inflammatory and some can be really anti-inflammatory. And so I think that's been a really fascinating contribution of a lot of your work is really, you know, not just looking at people as like having the same, you know, baseline and response and experience, but how, those, the meaning and the culture that goes on yes. top of that as well. So, um, you know, and I think it's really fascinating too, to talk about the causes of health, right? Cause a lot of yes. times we focus on the disease and I think for, um, sensitive people too, you know, we have sensitive empath, intuitive people, um, especially tuning in to watch this. And I think a lot of times they've been told that there's something wrong with them. Um, and you know, that there, there's something broken, they're not fitting into maybe this bigger cultural context that they're in. Um, and often it makes them start looking for problems or avoiding things. So um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, that particular population of sensitive people, empaths, intuitive people, and what sort of, you know, difficulties they might face, but also what are the benefits, especially like the immune benefits of being a sensitive person? Yes, and, and as you know, uh, most of us have that ability. Some people are born with it very clearly and other people have to develop it. And what happens sometimes is, uh, as I'm sure your audience will agree, that when they start sensing things or being empathic in a particular way, in a way it's admonished by the culture. The culture doesn't want to see anything outside of the, out of the box. So they begin to see that as some kind of, a, as you said, some kind of deficit or some kind of um, 
awkwardness about it. And sometimes people then will suppress that till it comes back and it keeps giving them a message that you have to do this. So like anything else, if you're an empathic or an intuitive, uh, is that you have to put it into a, a balance. What Aristotle said, everything has to be in balance. Uh, for example, um, pride is, is, a, is, a, is a virtue. But if you go too, hot, too much to the right, it's, it's a conceit. If you go too much to the left, it's fear. So one of the things that I work with when I work with that population of people is to help them understand that since they have a gift, there's a tendency to give too much without taking care of themselves. And then what happens then is they develop problems because they're looking out to take other uh, people's uh, problems and needs. And I find that in many cases, you have a, uh, a reaction that's called empathic fatigue. So you could have too much em empathy. And especially at work, there are people that have burnout and people that have empathic fatigue. And the symptoms are very similar, but burnout is that you work too hard and you take a vacation, you come back. Empathic fatigue is you've given too much. And if you take a vacation, you come right back and you start giving too much again and there's no, no gain. So it's very important to be able to find the balance and to be able to do the intuitions with self, the intuitions or the em empathic process with self so that then you can have a balance and you can say, okay, these are my limits. This is as far as I can go. And in some cases you have to say no and give people permission to not like it. So setting limits is really important. In, in that sense. Yeah. So, you know, we talk about that there are these gifts to being sensitive. So when, when a person is really sensitive or they have this experience of having empathy fatigue, what are ways that they can use these gifts of that they have for their own self-care? What are some practices or ideas for them to start taking those steps as opposed to just taking a vacation to like let off steam or recharge and then come back to the same right. thing? Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a good question. The way to look at it is that, um, we have, um, especially if you're, the, the Germans have a great wor a word for it. They call it uh, Weltschmerz, which is world suffering. So if we take too much of the world suffering, then we don't have any time, any peace to, to uh, create the human growth hormones that we need to recuperate. So one of the things to do is to, to become aware of what your phenomenology is. What is that you're thinking all day? Are you thinking about the problems of the world? Are you thinking about the problems of everyone else? That build smirts that the Germans talk about. And that is one of the indicators of, of uh, empathic fatigue. So if you can't stop and not look at the world as, as the suffering, because it's, it's very empathic, it's very good to see the suffering, but not 24 seven, because then you have no empathy for yourself. So that's one of the first things to do. And the other one is to see, and you know this well, because you know biocognition is that to see, what archetypal wounds are you bringing into your, your empathic uh, or, or, um, or your, any of the um, intuitives and so forth? <clears throat> and what that means is that we, are, we come from a tribe, we come from groups, and those tribes want us to stay within the group or they want us to be within the group and not individuate. And when we do that, they have what I call the archetypal wounds, which is I see them in all cultures, which is that they can either whether they do it physically, emotionally, intellectually, they can either abandon you, shame you, or betray you. And then what happens is if you walk in with an, with an archetypal wound of, uh, for example, shame, then anytime you see shame, you're gonna go there and try to help it and try to deal with it more than, than it's within that Aristotelian mean. And what you're doing is you, you're not working out your own archetypal wounds and you're putting it out there and helping, and projecting, but not cleaning up yours. So one of the things that I suggest, and it's in my books, as you know, that uh, looking at, if you have archetypal wounds, and most of us do, uh, to clean it up, it, I ex explain how to do it, so that then you know that you're not overreacting to something. That's another way to understand that you wanna have limits. So if, uh, if you have, and the other part about it too, is that is if you're too sensitive, you might be picking up that other people are trying to do things to you. Mm -hmm. because it's for the archetypal one. So for example, let's say you're very empathic or, or you're very uh, intuitive and you see a signal out there and you have an unresolved archetypal wound of shame. You say, oh, this person's trying to shame me. So it works both ways. It works mm -hmm. you giving out, but you responding. And, it, and if you over respond, that means that you're working on, arch on one of your archetypal wounds and there are ways to resolve them. And as you know, also there are psychoneurological responses to each of them. So they're hurting you in different ways. 
Yeah, definitely. And this was such a fascinating part of your work when, you know, I was studying it under you and kind of understanding these different types of wounds, because what was so interesting was that you were kind of laying out this PNI or physiological fingerprint that each of these wounds have. So walk, walk us through that a little bit. Like if somebody is trying to understand if they experience one of these wounds or more than one of them, what would they see or feel or notice in their body or their mind if they experience abandonment, shame, or betrayal? Yeah, that's a really practical question. That's a uh, brilliant. <laughs> Very good. Um, I think that um, what happens is that uh, it, if you're wounded one time, you're abandoned one time, that's all right. But if it's a pattern and, and you have to actually go back and, and at, at a contemplative state of more than relaxation to really go back, when was the first time that I felt this or I felt that? And, and usually it happens as a pattern and it happens from people that are very important to you. And we're, we're designed to pay a lot of attention to our culture editors, parents and so forth. So when they wound you, not only do they wound you, but they create a, a language of love wrapped around that wound. So if you, if you are abandoned, then the mind body code says abandonment equals love. So you look for love that either abandons you or you abandon, but the three, archetypal wounds to your question, which I think is really important. Uh, they each have a, a, a different set of, of variables. Abandonment is the most primitive because you, you abandon a child, they die. That's the most primitive. But the abandonment is not just uh, physical. Let's say you're in kindergarten and, and you have a pattern of your parents. You see all the children having their parents picking them up and you're waiting and waiting and waiting. Well, you begin to feel isolation, the temperature for abandonment is cold. You feel cold. And because you're constricting your, your vascular system, vessels are constricting, uh, and you feel a sense of isolation and aloneness. That has an, a psychoneurological effect in that what you're doing is you're going to hypoimmunity. You're reducing your immune response. And that reduction of immune response can then make you uh, not cause, but make you more prone to hypoimmunity, which uh, infections, cancer, anything that has to do with a lower immunity. And, and that's the psychoneurological. You get, you get, of course, a stress response, but it's a stress response that actually constricts cold. And you'll see the others are a little different. So that's a cold um, reaction. And if it's a pattern, then you learn that. And you learn to see it everywhere. And some, sometimes people will say, you know, I've been married three times and every time I've been abandoned because you're speaking the language fluently, like alcoholism and so forth. The second one is a little bit more sophisticated. The second one is a shame and it's hot. What you feel is hot, uh, embarrassed, you want the earth to swallow you, and you can't embarrass a child till they have some kind of identity. You can't, and you can't shame them until they can see themselves in the mirror and say, that's me. And people will say, no, I can shame a one-year-old. No, you can't. What you're doing is you're scaring them, but not shaming. Shaming has to have some kind of ego structure that, and children usually, when you shame them at first, they think that everything is wrong with them. An adult will say, my behavior is wrong. A child will say, all of me is wrong. So shame is hot. The emotion is embarrassment. And the psychoneurology, which has been studied the most, is inflammation. You begin to secrete tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukins two. And what's happening is the immune system, since it's cultural, it assumes that there's some kind of pathogen there that it needs to surround with inflammation, but there's no inflammation. So therefore you develop a systemic inflammation and that is related, not caused, but related to autoimmune illnesses. I've seen many, many cases, I'm sure you have to with uh, fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis, high percentage of some archetypal wound of shame. So you, you're learning uh, the inflammation. And the, the third, which is the most complex is betrayal. And betrayal is hot, but also constricting. So look how interesting. One constricts hot, the other one constricts cold. But it's the same kind of constriction with different kind of psychodermatological processes. And what you feel is anger, always anger when you've been betrayed. You, you feel tricked that someone has played with you and, and taken advantage. And with a child, let's say a four-year-old, you tell them, you want me to let you use my iPhone? Oh, yeah, yeah, do a little dance. And they do a little dance and say, no, I'm sorry. They don't, they're not embarrassed or they're not, they're not uh, ashamed. They're angry and they turn red. So it's hot, constriction, 
but different kinds of uh, uh, secondary immunological. And the correlation there is not cause, a correlation is uh, strokes and cardiovascular kinds of problems because of the overusing of the system different than the abandonment. So you see, it, one is hyperimmunity or, or hypoimmunity, the other was autoimmunity, and the other one is just a, a physiological response that puts a lot of pressure on the heart, on the brain, because you're constantly looking for somebody who's going to trick you. And I see that with executives. Sometimes so I work with executives of big companies and, and they bring in their wound. And if they have a wound of, of uh, betrayal, they're going to be micromanagers, autocratic, because it's an issue of trust. So you see how it correlates and it goes out in, even to the, to the work uh, place. Yeah, uh, yeah, these were such fascinating understandings because not only is this emotional experience or maybe this you know, psychic experience that people are having in their mind or in their feelings, but there's also this biochemical reaction that happens. Like that's the whole basis of all this psychoneuroimmunology of how your thoughts and your emotions and your beliefs impact your immune system and your nervous system and, and the hormones that are released from there. Um, but there's also, you know, that layer of that cultural experience too, where some things can cause these wounds or cause different feelings of shame in different cultures. And um, I remember you had a really fascinating example um, that I'd love for you to share if, if you can right now about um, aging women in different cultures and how women in Western cultures, as they age or they reach menopause, um, you know, it's kind of like seen as this very negative experience, but there's a contrast to that in other cultures. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and, and the, uh, the best contrast is when you look at some countries like in South America, the, when you're having menopause and you have the, the hot flashes, they call it bochorno, which means shame. Uh, and even doctors who know that it's hormonal, they'll, they'll say she's having the symptoms of shame. Okay, we know that shame causes in, uh, inflammation. These women have more problems with pain, more inflammation, lower self-esteem, lower libido. So you would think, well, that's part of the hormonal process. But then you go to Japan and other places, they call it konenki, which is a second spring. Women, self-esteem goes up, inflammation is not an issue, pain is not an issue, libido goes up, because it's a cultural interpretation of some kind of physiological response. Yeah, that's such a fascinating example. And, um, you know, I, it stuck with me for so many years, because just thinking about how we talk about things like women's health, for example, or any sort of um, any sort of disease process or like the pathologies that we generally look at in Western medicine yeah. is very much like it's degenerative. We've labeled you. We now know like who you are and we're pigeonholing you to an area. And then this idea where we're looking at this same natural process that happens like menopause, for example, and in one culture, we're seeing this kind of predominance of women having an inflammatory response to it because it's shameful and then this beautiful idea of that same process being called the second spring. Yes. And, you know, that in and of itself is really telling and powerful how culture can do that. But, you know, you talked about this idea of cultural editors too. And, you know, sometimes I think people will go, well, shoot, I live in a country or a part of the world or in a culture that is putting me down or has negative views of something. Um, and I can't just pick up and move to somewhere that's going to, you know, the whole culture looks at me positively or looks at my, yeah. you know, disease or symptoms positively. But so tell us a little bit more about cultural editors and how people can actually create a culture themselves. Um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be like the ethnic culture or the family culture. Um, talk about those cultural editors. That's right. The, uh, uh, they can come out of the, of the fishbowl. The, the culture, we're, we're designed to pay attention to people that at very early that will keep our survival. So you're, you're born and then you're hungry and you cry. Well, that's a, that's a, not a psycho, but a neuroimmunoendocrinological reaction of hunger because you still don't have the cognition. So, okay, you have that and there's a physiology. Then you go to your mother or to the breast or to the bottle, it satiates that. It's a different psych, uh, neuro, neuroimmunological response, but then language comes in and then you say, oh, that's a breast, that's mother, that's a bottle. That immediately, that word becomes biosymbolic. It becomes biological. And <clears throat> since you have to pay attention to the culture editors, they have tremendous placebo and nocebo effect, good and bad. So you, you already know that. The other culture editors are doctors and clinics, uh, theologians or, or 
um, priests and, and, and rabbis and so forth and, and temples and teachers in school. And, and we are already designed to pay a lot of attention to those people, especially doctors have to be very careful with what they say to, to their patients because it's like a reality. Uh, uh, the, the, a little study, so you can see, you, you go to, a, um, there's two groups. One group, they tell them, we want you to come here and the environment is set up with its, its uh, metal chairs, a lot of light, and nurse dressed in white with a syringe in her hand, and they give them a placebo, just a, an, an, an inactive uh, pill, and they say, look, we're gonna give you this pill to see how fast your heart starts beating fast. But if you pass out, don't worry, because we can give you an injection and you come right back. Look at the, uh, the expectations that are being set up. And they measure physiologically, and the people, blood pressure goes up, or some even have a little tachycardia. Uh, in the other group, they say, we're gonna give you this pill, and it's a soft lighting, their couches, and we wanna see how long it takes you before you get really relaxed. And if you fall asleep, there's a couch there. And that's exactly what happens. The, the, the demand characteristics of the environment. So words have power, especially coming from people in, in culture. So that's a thing to be aware of. But a lot of times, you know, people talk about, okay, how can a thought, how can an emotion affect the immune system? How can, if I say you're so dumb, how can it affect you? It's very difficult to explain unless you go to the anthropology and say, okay, about 30,000 years ago, we didn't have language, we didn't have a consciousness, and everything was uh, smell and, and the uh, senses. And then you could say, um, okay, you could smell a lion at 100 feet. Now, with language, there's a, there's a lion at 100 feet. And the immune system and the nervous system had to evolve into understanding the symbols mm -hmm. that... Smelling a lion is just as bad as saying there's a lion. So the culture became, uh, the brain became cultural and the immune system became cultural and understanding the brain. So then you have these culture editors and they tell you things and that's your reality. So you weave a, a, a fabric around the culture, what the culture editors tell you. So they say, if you're a girl, don't ever go into mathematics because girls are not good at mathematics. And you fulfill that, that, that prophecy because you create a selective perception that anytime you have a problem with math, oh, there you go, I'm a girl, what, what am I gonna do? Uh, so those are the, that's how we shape ourselves mm -hmm. and intuitives and empathics and so forth have even more concern because they're more able to feel things at a level that most people don't. So you have to be more careful mm -hmm. in, in these kinds of things that happen to us. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And you're talking about how these symbols and we've evolved so that these symbols actually are just as meaningful as maybe the sight or smell of something um, and why they do impact sensitive or empathic intuitive people more because symbols mean so much more to people like us because people who are not sensitive rely a lot more on their five senses, right? Not, sure. yes. not any sort of sixth sense or not some sort of interpretation of what's going on. So that's such an interesting way of looking at why, um, you know, through an anthropological perspective. Um, and so, you know, for sensitive people who maybe have identified that they feel some of these um, wounds, you know, and I, I, I kind of love, you know, talking about these wounds and the idea of what trauma looks like, that sort of overwhelm that gets kind of stayed in our system. But, you know, similarly, I always tell people, well, if you're repeating something, you know, 10 times over to your partner or your um, therapist or whatever, it's usually not the issue anymore. Like if you're yeah. constantly saying, I feel lonely, I feel lonely. It's probably not an issue with your relationship or something, you know, that you have to just work out a better mindset around. There's probably an actual traumatic wound there. So the for people, possibly. yeah. Yeah. So when, you know, these wounds that you talked about, the abandonment, the shame and the betrayal, um, can you give us some examples of how people actually start to unwind those? Like, is there any way of helping that? Is there any hope for people who do, who do kind of identify with that? Yes. The good news is that there's also psychoneurological reaction that I call the antidosis, you know? So if you uh, have a, uh, an archetypal wound of, of abandonment, for example, you take it everywhere and you take it especially to love because that's the language that you were taught. Now, intellectually, you may say, oh, no, no, I'm not going to be like my mother, but if you've already programmed that. So what I found is that uh, I, th I thought if, if, if these things are wounding you at a biological level, at a biocognitive level, there has to be some kind of antidote. And the antidotes are for abandonment 
it's a consciousness of, of commitment to self when you have an abandonment issue. For shame, it's honor. And for the um, betrayal, is loyalty. And the one that, that we're going to actually, we're going to be testing it in Poland at, at the center that I told you about. Uh, clinically, I've been able to show, as you know well, that uh, honor is anti-inflammatory. But we haven't been able to really take it and look at biological markers and things like that, like uh, the tumor necrosis factor and things like that. So we're going to be doing that now. And the reason is that look at the wounds that someone creating a helplessness and the antidote of someone you allowing yourself to re-empower yourself. So if you, for example, you are at, a, at your job and you are a board member of a big company and you come in and it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, how much money you're making, we're just human. And you come in late and the person in charge says, oh, there you are. I can always count on you being late. That's wonderful. And, and, and you feel this tremendous sense of embarrassment uh, or abandonment, whichever it is. But let's say uh, embar and the embarrassment. You turn red and at that moment, you first take a deep breath and identify where it's landing in your body, chest, your stomach, whatever. And you stop and you say, what is the honorable thing that I need to do here at this moment? And it could be, yes, you're right, I'm late. Um, I'll talk to you about that later. So, and you said, it. the moment you do that, you have an honorable consciousness. You're gonna have a different physiological response. Then later, and with a wound, you always have to set limits. Later, you talk to that person, you say, look, I, uh, I'm, I apologize for being late. I'll take care of the problem, but don't do this to me again. I'm a professional. Setting limits because then you're owning that. That's an example of how you can do it. And you know when you're in a wound, when you're over responding to something because you're dumping the history of the wound into the moment. Somebody says, uh, uh, what's wrong with your hair? What do you mean what's wrong with my hair? And you start reacting and you start feeling embarrassed. Well, you're bringing in the, the, the shame. <laughs> Well, so I'm curious, like that's something that's come up a lot too in the discussions around sensitive people because they often are tuned into their own feelings. And so they might notice their own overreaction to something, but yes. maybe they're in a relationship with somebody else who overreacts or they have a family member who overreacts to stuff. Are there ways that, you know, sensitive people can, you know, somehow gently remind their, their loved ones or some like coworker or a family member who they're reacting to their wounds without actually going in and fixing the problem for them or yes. taking on their wound or suffering. Yeah, and in relationships, uh, it's a guardians of the heart and they're working with, with the wounds because you, you come into a, re a relationship to, to heal your wounds and then to grow. But uh, let's say there is someone else and uh, that person, uh, I think Socratic methods are really, really good for this because if you say to somebody, you shouldn't be doing this. Well, what do you mean? I'm not doing anything, that kind of thing. So, so for example, you have a, a coworker who has a way of making you feel embarrassed and you know you have an archetypal wound. Okay, so that coworker says, uh, oh, I, that dress doesn't really look good on you. And immediately you want to, you, you, get, you get the shame and you stop and you breathe and do the technique that I mentioned. And then you say, okay, what is the Socratic thing? The Socratic is a question. Oh, really? What? It doesn't look good. Uh, what color do you think I should wear? You make people own up what they're doing. Well, I think you should wear red. I'll think about it. And if it looks good, I'll do it. Thank you. That's it. You break the software. You don't, they're inviting you to go into shame. And what you're doing is honorably using Socrates to ask the question. Somebody said, you're such an idiot. Really? Tell me when am I an idiot and how? It's very important, it disarms people. So it gives them an opportunity to reflect. And if you're with a sociopath, it's not gonna work. Sociopaths don't care. But usually normal people begin to understand. And, uh, and, and then another way to do it is, uh, you just said that, um, that I don't look good. And you said that a few times, are you aware of that? No, I'm not. Okay, do you give me permission to point it out to you when, when you're doing it? Yes, okay, you're doing it right now. <laughs> and then the next thing is, how does you think I feel when you do this to me? I don't know. Well, let me tell you how I feel. I feel an embarrassment. So do you have another way to deal with this? See, always putting it back on the person. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very powerful way. For example, some, some, sometimes people will say, I have a very toxic uh, uncle. Every time I call him, I don't want to call him because the first thing he says is, oh, so you haven't called me in three months. You must be very busy, right? So. And they're inviting you to bite. 
So what you can do is, you know, I'm so impressed that you could keep time so well. Absolutely has spent three months. What are they going to do? <laughs> Yeah, that's great. I mean, you're acknowledging what they're saying, yeah, but you're right. almost not, you know, not feeding into the shame that's or the right. embarrassment around it. No software. And then they say, well, I'm angry. Okay, look, we can talk another time when you're not angry, but you're right. You're really good at keeping time. We'll talk later. And again, you see how it's setting limits and giving people permission to not like it. Yeah, that's so important in, in the process of healing. Yeah, I think that that's a big kind of sticking point for sensitive people is they they don't want to give themselves or other people permission to not like what they say or do. I mean, there's so much about wanting to be accepted or liked. Um, yes. And a lot of that is what's driving, um, you know, a lot more of the suffering or the, the wounds as well. From the wounds, so they, you want to be loved for, in, in your wound. You try to avoid it because you want to be loved. You don't want to be abandoned. You don't want to be shamed. So you overdo. And if the intuitives and, and the empaths and so forth have those abilities, they're going to turn to over, uh, kind of overdo it and you go to empathic fatigue and you go into all these other kinds of things and then if you're not healthy you can't help anybody yeah yeah definitely i think that's such an important concept that um it's easy to forget as a sensitive person because you're feeling so much outside of you that you're not necessarily realizing that it's super important to take care of yourself and your health so that you can show up for yourself and others in the world yes. huh? rather yes. than putting that and another point there that the cultures do the, the cultures give you a pass with illness. So if you say, uh, somebody says to you, uh, let's go for a walk. No, look, I want to meditate. Oh, meditate some other time. Come on, let's go. For and they keep pushing. If you say, I have a migraine. Oh, okay. Can I help you with anything? So the brain says, oh, so getting sick is good. What happens? To bring some consistency, then getting sick is a way of turning off. Even if you feel sick, look at a part of your body that's not sick and say, no, no, I just don't want to do it because I want to meditate. And then you give them permission to not like it. Well, I don't like that. Well, I'm sorry you don't like that, but we can do it some other time. Yeah. And that's how centenarians are. I, I talked to a centenarian. I may have told you before, but he was uh, uh, about 101. And I said, could I see you Saturday? And he said, yeah, sure, Saturday. Because um, I really want to talk to Oh, no, of course we can do it. I said, 9 o'clock? And he said, no, no, I have tango lessons at 9. We can, I can see you at 2. <laughs> Instead of saying, okay, you know, giving up their joy, no, why should you do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And you have done so much work with centenarians and kind of studying about longevity and how to not just live a long life, but a life that's full of quality as well. Yeah. Um, and you were, you were telling me uh, earlier about, you know, working on, with this institute in which you're doing research about it. So tell, tell our listeners and our viewers a little bit about that and tell us a little bit more about your work with longevity and centenarians. Well, this place is really good. I'm, I'm a, a consultant there on, on their board of scientists. And this place is really uh, state of the art. They're in, in Warsaw in Poland. And what they're doing is they're doing all bio, bio, bio uh, especially the genetic and epigenetic biological markers. So they do blood work and saliva. And they look at the usual medical procedures or, or, or testing, but they go beyond that. They look at mitochondria. They look at... Uh, um, all kinds of things that are very, very important. Um, the way that you metabolize uh, your, uh, actually cell aging. And what they find is that there's a chronological age and there's a biological age. And this is again, very good at, at bringing my work together because it's right in tune with that. So you're 30 and that's it, your chronological age. There's nothing you can do about that. But then with the markers, they say, well, you know, you are, 10 years younger than your age or 10 years older than your age, and it doesn't stop there. What can we do to change that? Lifestyle, sometimes supplements, sometimes uh, the uh, peptides, but we bring psychoneuroimmunology in, and while now we develop the test, when you take the uh, this test that I developed, it'll show you how close you are to the four components of, uh, of the centenarians. How, how close are you to living like centenarians? And then you correlate that to the biological markers and you teach people to live centenarian consciousness as well as changing their style and everything. And you see biolo biological age reverting even more. Wow. So it's very specific and very scientific, but giving you a way to do things, not just with supplements, because that doesn't work mm -hmm. in the long run, mm -hmm. changing mindsets and changing the default mode. So then you can live um, like they do. So. Yeah. So we identify the four factors. We see how it correlates with, with your biological markers, both genetic and epigenetic. And for your audience, 
Genetic is a DNA transfer, your color of eyes and, and predispositions for illnesses. The epigenetics, what you're transferring that you learn, non-DNA, mm -hmm. how you live your life, how you uh, view the world. And people who have been at Auschwitz uh, and other concentration camps, they have a very high level of uh, cortisol, obviously, because you're going to get killed. But they pass that on for up to 10 generations wow. because of the epigenetic component. Wow. So they look at epigenetics and they say, okay, this is what's happening here. It's a propensity here. How can we change that? And they start, start giving them packages of changing that, not only physiologically, but psychoneurologically. Wow, that's so fascinating. Um, can you briefly tell us some of those components of what makes centenarians live kind of those full life? What, what are those aspects that they- Yes, that um, and, and some of it is proprietary, but I can give you uh, in general the ideas. Mm -hmm. One of them, the most important is time consciousness. And I'll go into it a little deeper so you can see. There are four, but I'll give you one. Um, time consciousness is your perception of the time that you have, that you're doing, and some people live in the urgent present. They're, they're here and they're thinking about next. And, and then they think, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. What happens? You turn 40. Oh, I don't have time. You turn 80. Oh, I really don't have time. So you're having a physiological, psychoneurological response. And centenarians have all the time in the world. How it applies, if you, you talk to gerontologists and they'll say, well, you know, as you grow older, your brain deteriorates and you're going to feel that time is passing faster. Oh, well, okay, that, that's, that makes sense. It's not true. What's happening is that the first 30, you have your first love, your first marriage, your first sex, your first this, your first that, your first graduation. And when the brain is paying attention to novelty, it elongates the perception of time. Centenarians don't have that problem because they're always curious. They'll say, what is in that plant over there behind you? Oh, look at those, uh, look at that little, picture you have here constantly with curiosity so that it's not 30 they're curious until they die so then they prolong the sense of time but let's say you're you're low on that on that factor then we teach how to come out of that urgent present and begin to teach you that basically you're living the portals as you know the portals are infancy and and the most difficult to deal with is middle age which doesn't exist you ask the centenarian what's middle age i'll find out when i die they don't know. <laughs> what do your doctors have to say about that? I don't know. They're all dead. So, <laughs> you know, it's a, but yesterday, let's say 45 is middle age. Yesterday you were 44 and almost 40. You're not middle age. But today you become middle age. And the culture admonishes into looking middle age, acting middle age, dressing middle age, and getting sick like the middle age. Mm. So it, it's, it's a cultural imposition. Centenarians don't have, they, they live portalless. Mm -hmm. So they have a perception of time that's very different. So that's one of the factors. And look at all the things you can do by changing that. Yeah, yeah that's fascinating. I love that idea of, you know, staying curious till the day you die, like rather than it just being from some urgency of reaching some point in life and being able to sit back and relax. This idea of how curiosity is a big part of being present and being alive. Very much. And, and you know uh, how people, re, uh, they'll work and they'll say, I can't wait to retire so I can go fishing and watch the sunset in Florida. They die within four years because there's no passion. There's no creativity. There's nothing psychonomologically to have that value. If you watch the sunset every day, it's good. But you have to have, uh, I don't think we talked about the Aristotelian um, um, last time that we talked about the, the eudaimonia. Did we talk about that? Okay, this is really important because just look at how the immune system can tell the difference. 2,300 years ago, Aristotle said, the hedonic life is not enough. The life of pleasure for pleasure is not enough. You have to have eudaimonia, what he called. And that means that you have to find pleasure and excellence of meaning, purpose, and service. So, okay, that's really nice. Aristotle, what does he know? There's some research, very recent research in, in psychonomenology that looked at something that's very specific, CTRA, which are about 21 to 40, depending on the situation, uh, genes in the immune cells that are anti-inflammatory, uh, antibodies, and antiviral, especially for COVID, antiviral. And they did a psychological test to see, okay, who's hedonic and who's eudaimonic? And then they measured the CTRA, conserve 
uh, transcriptional response to adversity. It's got a beautiful name. So they looked at that, and the people that were more Aristotelian had a better CTRA responders than the other people. But even more interesting, when you measure the level of pleasure in two, it was the same, but the immune system could tell the difference. Wow, that's so fascinating. That's so interesting. Um, and so, you know, we were talking about this idea of pleasure, and I know some of the other things you've mentioned. Um, I remember rituals being one of them, like doing yes. practices as rituals. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. The rituals are really one of the causes of health. Hmm. And rituals are things that you, a routine, you, you take a shower to be clean. Uh, you brush your teeth to be clean. Those are functional things. A ritual is something that has a higher level of significance. And it's something that identifies you with yourself and your family or something that you look forward to and you never abuse a ritual. So examples that I've talked about before that, you know, uh, one centenarian in, in Cuba and this woman, uh, she was about 100, 101. And I asked her anthropologically, I didn't say, what are your rituals? Because that can mean many things. I said, what has meaning to you that you do on a regular basis? And it gives you a pleasure that really grounds you on who you are. And she said, oh, I have a, a shot of rum before I go to sleep every night. So at first I thought, it's got to be the Cuban rum. Oh, I got to ch check that out. Uh, then I asked another ma a man and he said, I have a cigar when I wake up. It's got to be the Cuban cigar and the rum. Finally, after I saw enough of these people, it's the ritual. Mm. But none of them abuse it. You push the limits and you say, how many shots of rum do you have? One. Why? Because that's all that I feel good about. Mm -hmm. How many cigars do you have? One or maybe two. Why not more? That doesn't interest me. So they don't abuse rituals. You can abuse routines, but not rituals. If, yeah. if that's the definition of a ritual. And I've never seen um, a centenarian who is um, obsessive about things, doing more than they need to. Mm -hmm. You give them some wine and they drink the wine, but they don't. You want other? No, thank you. But not, they don't do it out of fear. They do it because they know who they are. Mm -hmm. And that's where intuitives can, can actually pick up very well. What, what, are, what is my phenomenology? What, what are my limits? And what are my rituals? And then intuit, this is as far as I go. Wow. Right? And other people will try to push it. If you come from cultures that food is love, come on, come on, clean your plate. No, no, thank you. No, come on, clean your plate. No, no, thank you. Um, the people in uh, Bangladesh are starving. Okay, here's my plate, give it to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you talk about also with these centenarians too, that they have this aspect of healthy narcissism, which is oh, yeah, yeah. something that, um, you know, I think sounds maybe horrific to a sensitive person. They go, oh my gosh, like, I don't want to try to do something that's narcissistic, but help us understand what healthy narcissism is and how it can contribute to these causes of health and that you've seen it in centenarians. How can sensitive, empath, intuitive people also learn from this? That's great because you know, in biocognition, you ask some really great questions that are so important. So I'm glad I appreciate that. Um, my mentor, George Solomon, coined that word. He called it healthy narcissism. And it's not a good word because, as you know, it has a lot of negative connotations with people, sociopaths and narcissists and so forth. But the way to look at it is that uh, one centenarian, I, by, by telling stories, it's easy to get complex information out. They gave him a party. I interviewed him and they treated him like, uh, like they're uh, superstars. So they have a party and the many women around and he comes up to me and he says, have you noticed how the women are looking at me? They love me. That's narcissism, right? And if it stops there, that's narcissism. But he said, have you noticed how beautiful they are? Inclusive narcissism. Everyone, and they don't want to manipulate. And narcissists will say, since they think I'm beautiful, and since they love me, I'm going to manipulate them. That's the difference. So I look at more as a self-worth, inclusive self-worth, inclusive, uh, laudable assessment of self. Because you, you're right, the narcissism has a really bad connotation, but that's how they that's how we call it, healthy narcissism. So you want to apply that too, especially with your population, you want to apply it and look at it. But what happens though, is that we're taught to excel and then to deny it. After you do, look how well I'm doing. No, but don't tell anybody because you know, that's just not, not it's conceit, don't, don't tell anybody. Or if they say, I love your hair. Oh yeah, I got to cut it, I have to cut it. Or you say, uh, thank you very much. I say, no problem. You go to a restaurant. When, when somebody says thank you and you say, oh, my pleasure, you're going to have oxytocin because you're going to gratitude. But if you say no problem, the brain says, 
I'm avoiding problems. So it, you kill the psychoneurological benefits that you could have. And no problem, what does that mean? You're just, are you expecting a problem? And, and that's how our cultures work. It's, it's always with uh, a, a kind of almost like a paranoia about things not going well. Yeah, that's so fascinating to kind of look at it from that perspective of, oh, there's no problem, we're avoiding a problem versus thank you and, and like steeping in that gratitude yeah. as well. Um, yeah, and you know, I, I always tell my clients that too, like rather than focusing on the disease and trying to avoid things out of fear, like avoiding certain foods in your diet, start filling your life and filling your plates and things like that with stuff that you love so that there's not room left for other things. You no longer have the hunger. You no longer have the need for those other things because you fill it with gratitude and you curiosity and these different concepts that you're talking about. Um, and, you know, you talked about this, this, the healthy narcissism, but it's also this idea of this inclusive self worth. Yes. Um, so tell us a little bit, like, how does a person assess their personal self-esteem or their self-worth? How, how can they kind of understand this for themselves? Um, one way to do it, because as you know, from the work you've done with me, that, that I try to take very complex things and put them down to earth simple. Because Einstein said, if you can't explain something in a simple way, you don't know what you're talking about. So I re remember that. In self-esteem, the way I look at it is that I break it down into three parts. The first is valuation self-esteem, which is how much do I allow myself to experience good things and good fortune without getting sick or sabotaging it? That's kind of a novel way of looking at it. That's valuation self-esteem, but there are the two. The, the second one is competence. How good are you as a doctor? How good are you as a parent? Um, and that's competence. And the third, which nobody talks about, is affiliation self-esteem, which says, who are the people that I bring into my life to share my good fortune and also to share my pain? People that, that are, those are the three. And you could check them out to see which one you're high or low. This is why somebody could be very competent in, in, in self-esteem. They run a multi-billion dollar company and they get home and their partner beats them up emotionally. You say, how is that possible? Because they have high competence and low valuation. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring them up and how do you bring them down? Valuation self-esteem goes up when you keep self-caring commitments. It goes down when you break them. That's simple. I'm going to go for a walk. Somebody calls me, oh, okay, I'll go for a walk tomorrow. Goes down. Um, competence, when you're not learning anything new, you got out of school and you haven't done anything in 10 years, competence, self-esteem goes down. It goes up when you're constantly learning. The curiosity of uh, um, centenarians have really good competence, self-esteem because of that. And affiliation is the quality of the people rather than the quantity of the people that you associate with. If the quality goes up, it, it goes up. If the quality goes down and everybody knows you, but nobody really knows who you are, it goes down. So you can evaluate that and then you have ways to change it depending on which one you think is low. Wow. That's so fascinating. Yeah. I love this stuff. And I do think, you know, that you have such a great way of breaking down complex subjects into these really understandable parts that people can apply. So for people who are new to your work or they want to dive deeper with this, where can they learn more? Um, where can they kind of really dive into these concepts and go back and review all these little things that we've talked about today? Well, uh, I have YouTube, Dr. Mario Martinez. Uh, I have over 300 videos that are free. Also have books, the two books that are bestsellers at, at Amazon, uh, The Mind Body Code, The Mind Body Self. And then biocognitive.com is my website. And there I have workshops that I do on a monthly basis, mentoring, diplomates, consultation. So it's a lot of information, but it's a lot of free information and also a lot of information that you pay for. So it's a combination of, of the two. So there's a, a, quite a bit of um, free stuff on articles and videos and uh, all kinds of things that you can really go deep into biocognition. And then if you want formal training, then you can uh, get the formal training. Yeah. And I think it's all, you know, stuff that I've seen is stuff that's really applicable to you know, any person who's going through these issues and struggling and also really applicable for clinicians who want to kind of up level the way that they understand things and complex stuff. Like I know you have protocols for really addressing things like fibromyalgia and helping people kind of get over, um, you know, these more difficult uh, scenarios that are a connection in that psychoneuroimmunology and how people kind of experience that. So um, that's, you know, a great place for people to find more there. Given everything that we have talked about today, um, and for the people who are listening, what is one thing you'd like to leave our viewers and our listeners with today that 
they can start doing to make change in their life right now? The power of the culture, I can never overemphasize how important that culture is. It'll, it'll heal you or kill you faster than your genes. It's just that how that works. And you have to look at where you come from and what you learned. And especially when you get to a level where no matter what you do, you're sabotaging something. It has to do with the self-worthiness and the things that we talked about. So look at your culture. And some people will say, well, I come from Japanese and Indian. It doesn't matter. It's just a conglomerate of the two. And, and what they taught you about health, what they taught you about relationships, but how they do it, not how they tell you. You learn what your parents do, not what they tell you. And that's what you take in. And then you live it out, even though intellectually you say, I'm never going to be like my parents. <laughs> yeah, that's been such a fascinating aspect of this. So, Dr. Martinez, thank you so much for sharing with us today, bringing all your wisdom and bringing this cultural element to the conversation as well. My pleasure. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, definitely. What a great session with Dr. Mario Martinez. Thank you all for listening. We will see you soon.